I'm Alan. I was a radio officer at sea for Marconi's from 1955 to 1963. From 1964 until 1978 I was a technician and in 1978 I went back to Sealink UK as a radio officer and from 1981 to 1988 I was with SAIT as a marine electronic technician and service manager. You had the golden years with Marconi? Yeah, yes, yeah. Would you have been with the Marconi Marine Division? Oh yes, yeah. And what sort of ships did you sail on? Uh, tankers and um, uh, um, normal uh, passenger uh, only 10 passengers, you know. Did you still have to have two radio operators? No. It was no. only passenger ships, had to have 20 hour yeah. coverage. 50, 50 people, 50 passengers or more, had to have 24 hours. But um, no, uh, normal 8 hour ships, they used to have just one radio officer on and when he wasn't on watch, you had an auto alarm, which is driven by a signal of 12 four second dots, or dashes, I should say, and uh, each dash separated by one second. When that is sent on 500 kilocycles, it, after four dashes, bells ring, and the radio officer then attends to the radio room and can hear any SOS. So uh, all the ships, uh, 16 hours a day, it's auto alarms, and eight hours a day, it's the RO on watch. So the RO, what? choice of uh, day and time would he then go and well, watch? Yeah, originally it was starting approximately 8 till 10 in the morning, 12 till 2, uh, 4 till 6 and 8 till 10. So that was spread right across. But latterly uh, they left it to the RO to do eight eight hours as he requires. So he yeah. could be awake all night and asleep all day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What Depends. are the names of some of the tankers you were on? Hayala, uh, Otina, uh, Opelia, uh, British Oak, Clyde Crusader, Border Reaver, Border Laird. Border Hunter. And did you have any narrow escapes? Because I would imagine you don't have much of a chance if a tanker goes up. No, I, I only had once when um, there was a fire in the engine room of the Border Reaver and that was put out quite quickly. How do you spell Reaver as in Border? R E I V E R. You were still always R E I V E R. And you were always employed by Marconi. Yeah, this is the emergency transmitter. So if a ship was in, in distress, the, this would be used to send the SOS. You'd switch, you'd switch the, the main switch on there. That switch would go over like that. That would start a motor underneath. The motor supplied the um, high tension to these valves here and you could transmit using a key over there yeah, and send SOS. Um, it's quite dangerous when it's open like this because that um, connection there uh, has got 600 volts at one amp and one radio officer was killed by that uh, by touching that when uh, he was cleaning the equipment. 
this machine transmits on 500 kilocycles, which is the international calling and distress, and it can be keyed by an automatic keyer that uh, is in the next room and that will send the auto alarm signal which as I said is four second duration dashes separated by one second so in a minute they can send um, 12 uh, signals dashes four second now the, these dashes then uh, trip the automatic alarm and the automatic alarm then rings bells in the radio room on the bridge and in the Sparks' cabin and on receiving that the Sparks runs to the radio room uh, starts his, machine, his transmitter and he knows then that there's a distress in, in operation. The transmitter can be used in normal communications as well, but it's, it runs off the batteries, the ship's emergency batteries. Yeah, and uh, what happens, you put the switch, press the button, the um, machine starts inside, uh, that gives 600 volts for the valves there the heating for the valves is via the um, the batteries direct. So it all looks very easily dismountable for replacement oh yeah are you yeah. taught how to replace items oh god yes yeah because you're you a see. You see it alone so you've got to be a mechanical yeah. engineer and a yeah. transmitter and this is where uh, a radio officer was was killed because he he had this lowered for repair and he leaned in to the equipment to clean the commutator in the uh, high tension area and he touched the 600 volt line and it killed him. See? Right, and there's the machine that the RO was working on and he was leaning over and he touched the uh, 600 volt and uh, it killed him. 600 volts is enough to kill a man. Oh my god, yeah, because it, it, it was very high temperature. If he was wearing rubber boots, oh, yeah. insulated boots, would but he have lived? I don't know. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't test it anyway. I wouldn't test it. No way. So, presumably a warning was sent out to all operators oh, oh, yes, result. yes. So but what I, was your close call then? You had a fire on board. On board a ship called the Border Reaver, there was a fire in the engine room, and everything was brought. We, we had the emergency lifeboat transmitter was moved to a lifeboat station, and we started everything up. We're all ready to send an SOS, but the steam smothering gear uh, killed the fire. How close were you to abandoning ship? Oh, oh, we hadn't even thought about it yet. No, it was just a fire in the engine room that was uh, the steam smothering gear was put into action, and it was out within about ten minutes. So uh, that was that was the end of that. Had you been involved in a uh, abandoned ship? No. How could you know? If you had ever been yeah. involved, what were you trained to do? Could you broadcast uh, distress messages from yeah. a lifeboat? Yeah, yeah. How would you, you do it? Well, you had uh, a lifeboat transmitter. Have we got a lifeboat transmitter? Not that I've seen in no. 
Now, you, the, there's a lifeboat transmitter was like a small dustbin, about that size, yeah? And you, you lowered it over the side of the ship into a lifeboat, and you had two handles, and you had to turn the handles, and that d generated enough power to drive the transmitter and the receiver. And it floated. And it floated, yeah. If you'd like to pop in, sir, and just uh, add something. Yeah. Were, were you going to add, or are you listening? No, I'm very just interested. About, just about the floating of it. Yeah. Please, please, add something. What could, who are you? I'm George Coburn. I, I was a radio officer with Marconi in my young and healthy days. And tell me a bit about this floating transmitter. Well, it's, it was bright orange and just like he said, bright orange, you turned handles, it's a generator and you could use a Morse key and send distress signals. And I've known it used, and I've spoken to people that have used it, but the biggest ships had lifeboats with radio stations in them, actually built into the lifeboat. So... Were you a Sparks who served on board ships? Yes. Uh, what were the names of the ships, do you remember? Oh. Empress of England, Degema, Vivian Louise. What sort of ships were they? All cargo ships. A couple of passenger ships. The Oriel was a passenger ship going down West Africa. I did that for a couple of years. How long were you away from home generally, guys? A 13-month trip was my longest. Yeah, mine was a year. A year? Yeah. You must have been going around the globe, weren't you? Oh yeah, yeah. We went all over the place. That's when Marco, when when Britain had a merchant navy. We haven't got a merchant navy now. What happened to it? Well, the politicians said, yeah. because of an island, we don't need a navy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and perhaps we could bring the merchant navy back if we uh, vote to go out. Uh, no, know. no, it won't. No, it, it, it was too too costly to run. But it, what is a merchant navy? Is it a nationalised industry? No, no, no. Separate companies. Yeah. There were All separate companies who yeah. joined together and that was called the merchant navy. Yeah. yeah. There's no yeah. joining up though, is there? No, no, with, with they're all... You know, there's yeah. speed link ferries and... Yeah. So it's not like the Royal Navy? Yeah. No, no, no. Right. no. We're just a bit better. Yeah, we went to sea, didn't we, George? <laughs> <laughs> what was your longest trip, sir? Thirteen months. What were you doing? I was a raid officer, going back and forwards to the continent and India and Persian Gulf, Arabian Gulf now, to Iran and all this sort of stuff, carrying oil. Was it a dangerous uh, profession? Were there wars going on at the time when you were there? Oh, yeah. Could your ship have been hit? Yeah, there's wars all the time out there. <laughs> and, but we didn't think about it. We were invincible at that age. Like well, everybody is at that age. So when did you join Marconi? 50, same, same year as you, 56 yeah. was it? 55. 55. Where were you trained? In... Bridlington, uh, the Northeastern School of Wireless Telegraphy in Bridlington. Where were you trained, Alan? Hall, Hall College of Technology. How many schools were there around the country? Seventeen. Yeah. I've just been told that. Yeah. yeah. That's a huge. That's a huge amount, isn't yeah. it, Alan? Yeah. Because universities had yeah. a section. Yeah. Uh, yeah it, it was, and it, and the the um, skill of of the teaching was variable because some places you didn't get the proper teaching. What uh, was what was proper teaching? What's your well? I failed <laughs> my more sending three times, and uh, it was only later on I found that I was taught the incorrect way of doing it. So it's a good job you didn't learn the incorrect way. Well, yeah, I did at first. Yeah, I did at first. And, uh, 
So how was Hull? Was it? No, I was Bridlington. Bridlington. How was the training at Bridlington? Very, very good. It was a private one. It wasn't a, a university one, a private school where you lived in. And I got my first class certificate there straight off. You must have been very proud in your career to follow in the footsteps of Bride and Phillips and that tradition. I didn't think of it. It's a, it's a job. You and you got in a ship. And of course you miss a lot. You can't go and play tennis and you can't yeah. go and play cricket no. and you can't go to parties or to the pubs no. and all this sort of stuff. You're isolated on a little island with usually about in those days about twenty or thirty other people. Yeah. Did you prefer it when there were two sparks on board so you had company? No. No, I I only had two sparks in one trip. And all the other trips were just. So, made. how did you make your own amusement? Well, I studied uh, correspondence courses, and there was a big library on board, of course, supplied by the Siemens Mission people. Were you thinking of some, what to do if you left Marconi? Was it? Uh, were you looking to improve yourself no, academically? On the technical side and the electronic side, and. I was fascinated by quantum physics, which wasn't wasn't much of a. It was a bit low key then. Alan, tell me what yeah. you know about quantum physics. Ah, well, nobody knows what quantum <laughs> physics is. Nobody. I mean, even the bloke who 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 started the study said, "Is if anybody knows, s tells you what." they know all about quantum physics and they're lying. Yeah, many, most people don't know how to spell it. Q-U-A-N-T-U-M. Very good. I mean they're after quantum computers now and your GPS system and your car wouldn't work without knowing something about oh. quantum computing. Yeah. Does, does the modern uh, electronics and the sparks situation, does it make you feel as if you worked in the stone age? No. 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 We, we, we were very, very highly trained and, and we did things that we should never have done like uh, uh, down in the engine room where, where there was electronic stuff down in the engine room we used to repair it we used to repair the radars everything yeah so this, does, this surprises me you had to be like the AA I mean you had to know all about your not only transmitting, you were complete sort of 12, 12 to 15 skills. Oh, God, yeah. And you've got to be careful More you, than don't, that, you don't kill yourself. Because I'm a quantum, I, 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 I used to uh, study as well, but not quantum physics. I, I was on quasars. We, we had a ship where we all was amateur astronomers. <laughs> <laughs> Because if you look at the sky yeah. at night in the yeah. middle of the Pacific, it's, yeah. there's nothing like it. No, there isn't. So it's did you have a telescope? Oh, God, yeah. No, oh, just big oh, binoculars yeah. I had. Yeah. And you were stargazing? Oh, yeah. yeah. Did, did you, you spot any new stars? Or? I wouldn't know a new star. Did you I ever see one. a new comet? A comet? I, no, I, I wasn't that. I just marvelled looking up there. I would imagine you could actually really see the Milky Way. Well, there's no pollution, there's no nothing. It, no. You see a thousand Which times better than here. Stars, eh? That's, you can't see it here because there's street lights. But in, at sea, when you lay down and look up, the, the whole sky is just covered, covered in stars. And I sailed on the ship where the chief officer was uh, an amateur astronomer like I've never met before. He had books and books about it. And I started reading about it. And in them days, which was 60, the quasar was the latest thing. And they didn't know what a quasar was. And many a night, the big discussion on the wing of the bridge was, what's a quasar? Can you see quasars from? Not obviously not with no, a human eye. No, Can you see it with a telescope? No. Yeah, yeah, but uh, you've got to have a real big one. 
And what they've found out now, it's the black hole in the centre of a galaxy where uh, stars are being dragged into it. But in them days, they didn't know. They didn't know. About black holes? No. no. And there's a black hole equal to 18 billion solar masses, 18 billion times the weight of our own sun. Yeah. I hope it's just a long that. distance away. Yes. When you came up to retirement, was it with sadness, or were you glad to, to be home on dry land? Well, we're both made we, redundant. We were both made redundant because the, the merchant shipping disappeared. So what I, years? About the same years? Yeah. More or less. About 78, I think, wasn't it, George? Uh, oh, mine was 78. Yeah. yeah. Would you remember. still have been young men at that age? No, I joined the aerospace company and did a lot of work there, uh, but it must have been 10, 15 years there. And I retired long after 65. So where did you go to when you were made redundant? Did you take the money and live the dream? No, I joined, within a week I had a job with an aerospace company and worked there until I retired. And what about yourself, Alan? Did I started my own company. Right, Quasar Limited? No, 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 no. It was a, a, a sliding wardrobe door company. Something completely different? Yes. yes. Not an electronic spark in sight? No. If this, is, this is a spark transmitter that is driven by an alternator that uh, supplies 500 cycles uh, alternating current and each half cycle produces a spark there which is called the quench gap spark that half cycle via a, trans a transformer produces a high pressure spark that goes into the tuning system up the top. You can change frequency by ad adopting moving the sparks there at the side. Um, the quench gap spark uh, transmitter was developed by the Germans just prior to the Second World War. This Is it true that Marconi stole the patent because of the war? No, no. They, 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 uh, I think that's too harsh a word. They got, originally got them uh, after the court cases in Australia where Marconi uh, was against um, the German Telefunken who had got into Australia and Marconi took them to court about the tuning patents. After that Telefunken and Marconi didn't have any patent problems. They, 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 uh, all patent problems were, were dealt with. Yeah. This is a tuning coil so that when the transmitter is transmitting it can be tuned to the antenna or aerial and this one is the inductance and uh, the inductance is also used in tuning as well this is tuning yeah tuning of the antenna what and, years uh, would these, this equipment be fitted? The uh, Titanic era? Yeah, yeah. That, that one is just prior or after the First World War. The first one is 1950s. This one's 1912. This one is... Uh, well, they've, they've said that it's the uh, uh, Morse Reader. Yeah, that's uh, for, for wireless telegraph. Where do you believe that uh, the 1912 one was made? Would that be New Street or Hall Street? Uh, I don't know, but I think uh, 1912 was when New Street was first built. 
New Street was better, so that's probably Hall Street. This is all time, yeah? This is a key with a, with, um, a, a tape through it, and when a signal is received, it just inks it. So, all you would, do you think that would have been? Uh, that would have been very, very early, about 1903, 1901. So that would be Hall Street? You, you would think so, yes, yeah. yes. Unless what does it do? It inks, if the, a receiver uh, gets a signal in, it, it triggers this to ink uh, a piece of paper like in this. What, what does it ink it with? Ink. And what does it, with English? Or does it translate no, no, with Morse? No, no. All you see is a large ink spot for dots, for dashes, and a small ink spot for dots. So you hold them and you read the moss off them. Yeah. Is that if you actually miss listening to it, or is it a recording no, no. device? No, the, the first receiver, the first receivers wasn't headphones. The first receivers were inkers. Yeah, they didn't have earphones. The first earphone was used by Marconi uh, on the Atlantic transmission. And, and these was the only thing with the receiver. You looked what the signal was. Well, and not a lot of people know that. No, Everybody they don't. believes that the, the Morse key yeah. and the earphones were used from the start. No, no, the, the earphones was used um, after the um, after this, uh, in fact, the Royal Navy, the Royal Navy, was insistent that they had inkers, so that they had a hard copy of signals received. And when Marconi developed the the magnetic uh, um, ma magnetic unit uh, then they used headphones but they wouldn't have had a copy recording of what the message no, was no they didn't no which they would would not mm. have preferred that they did but they gradually got to to uh, realize that the faster speeds with headphones was was the thing